Good morning. Glad that you are here. Since Tom's here, I feel obligated to do this. Say it with me. <laughs> if I get it right, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you so much. See, I told you I was going to mess that up. <laughs> I'm so used to Tom. Then it's good to see Tom and Sierra back with us. And I know it's been a rough couple of weeks. And there was, it's, all, it's always grateful for all of us to be together. It's, you know, it's, it's nice when we are missed, when we're not here. I know we have quite a few people that are, are traveling today. Some are sick. I know Kenny's homesick today. So we look forward to them being with us today. Uh, thank you for the scripture reading. The first reading that was done was in Psalms 46. That actually serves as our text, but to set the stage that was just read is what Mark read for us. Be still and know that I am God. They, th they think this psalm was written around 701 B.C. It's a very popular verse that's out there. I've seen it on church marquees quite a bit over the years. And I actually was at a store in uh, Weirds Valley, and I saw it on a wooden thing. I was actually having a rough day that day. I was seeing like everything I touched was not going right. And yeah, I'm sure we've all had those days. And I was in that store and saw that on a wooden plaque, and it just hit me. I thought, i got to be still and know that he is God. I wanted to buy it until I picked it up and saw the price, so I ended up just taking a picture up on my cell phone instead. But it serves as a reminder. And after that, I kept saying to myself over and over, be still and know that I am God. I would say throughout the day during work, I would wake up saying that verse. And this has been going on for like two months. I kept having to remind myself to remember who God is. You know, we need those reminders in life. To set the stage, uh, if you're still in 2 Kings chapter 18, we're going to be hopping around here in chapter 17 and 18 and 19. The king of, of Assyria was wanting the people of Jerusalem to come over to his camp. At this point, they had surrounded him, and they was in the best position to take over this city. In chapter 17, it is, tells us that he already taken over the king of Israel and their people. And in verse 2 in chapter 17, it says it's because he did evil on the side of the Lord. He's referring to the king of Israel, and it cost him his kingdom. The king of Assyria carried off the Israelites to Assyria, and their new target was going to be Jerusalem. He was going to do the same to them. It tells us in verse 13 how the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes. And in verse 14 says, But they will not listen, for they were stubborn. So God allowed them to be carried off. And in verse 12, it says, Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded, neither listened or obeyed. So it was their fault they didn't listen to God. But King Hezekiah did not reign the same way. In the scripture that was just read to us in chapter 18, for one thing, in verse 3, it tells us he did the, uh, the right in the eyes of the Lord in accordance to David his father had done. Then what Mark read to us said he trusted the Lord and the God of Israel, and there, there was no one like him of uh, the kings of Judah after him or before him. So he was faithful. And in verse 7, it says the Lord was with him. Whenever he went out, he prospered. So King Hezekiah was a special leader. He was a very great leader. Now the people of Jerusalem knew they were in great danger and they were fearing for their life. So what did they do? They turned to their leader and what they were going to be doing. Now how often do we do that? You think of those who lived in during uh, September 11. We turned to our president. We wanted to know what action we were going to take. So that's what we have a tendency to do. We turn to our leader to figure out what we're going to do. But king of the Assyria used that fear to turn the people toward him, or he tried to, that is. 
as he has done so many times before. Now I want us to pick up in chapter 18 in 2 Kings verse 28 and read the events that took place that day and see how the, he tried to use fear for people to turn over to his camp. And it said the rapture stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, hear the, uh, hear the word of the great Lord, uh, I'm sorry, the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hands. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us in the city we will not be given to the hand of the king of Assyria. Now I want to stop there for a second. You notice this, a little bit of cockiness here from the king of Assyria. Because after all, he has destroyed so many kingdoms. And he was he just was so confident and cocky. He just knew he was going to win this battle too. But now verse 31, it says, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for this says the king of Assyria. Make your peace with me and come to me. Each one of you will eat from his own vine each one from his own fig tree, each one will, lit, uh, will drink the water from his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land of your own land, a land of grain, a land of wine, a land of bread, a land of, uh, in vineyards, and a land of olive tree and honey. You've got to have that honey. And to make you live and not die. Do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying the Lord will deliver us. And we jump down to verse 36. But the people were silent, answering him not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. So King Hezekiah says, don't listen to him. Don't respond to him. And he's probably trying to tell them, don't uh, provoke your enemy. So and I got to thinking, all these things may seem good on the surface, but we always know things are not what always they seem to be. But doesn't the world try to do that to us? It tries to entice us to come over to the side of the world. It offers us things that we, th we will enjoy very temporarily. But Jesus warned us about this. He says, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Now, the reason the road is wide is so many people are taking that road. They are enticed by what the world offers. But Jesus warned us, don't go down that road. You know, and, you know, one thing we know that the king was offering fear to his offer to try to drive the people over. To give you a little bit of background about the king of Assyria, he had a superpower of an army. They were a very dominant force on the planet at that time. Everywhere they went, they conquered people. And they were, it was so easy for them to do it. They had the most brutal band of warriors at that time. You know, they were the most skilled, the most sophisticated weapons they had, and they often used psychological warfare as we see what they're doing here. They say the 185,000 men in their army, each one had a very particular set of skills within that army. They knew what they were doing. They were great in battle, and they were very good about killing people. So here they had besieged Jerusalem and the Syrians were out there and they were going to try and destroy them. You know, no one could stop him up to this point. No one can, uh, and they knew they, if they go in, they were going to destroy everybody as they had done so many times. You know, the things that they did to people were so graphic, we can't even share them today with all the young people in here. But I will say one thing they did they made people suffer while they were still alive for a long period of time. You know, these guys were bad, they were evil, and they were the very best on the planet for battle. And the people of Jerusalem knew this. I'm sure they've heard all kinds of stories about them. I'm sure they've heard the stories and how they took the people of Israel. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 1, it tells us as soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went to the house of the Lord. So we see here he was in such great stress of what potentially could happen. But King Hezekiah sent his service to Isaiah 
And Isaiah, verse 6, tells him, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid. Behold, I will put in him a spirit in him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword of his own land. So in the middle of the crisis here, King Hezekiah does something very interesting, actually two things. For one thing, he began to pray to the Lord. Then he also seek guidance from Isaiah, who was a very godly man. I think right there is, is a, something we can learn right there. Seeking advice from godly people. This leads us to uh, Psalms 46, if you want to turn there. This goes to our textual part, where it starts out, God is our refuge and strength, the very present, present help in trouble. You know, imagine yourself being surrounded by a group of men who, surrounded, who had brutal in their tactics. You know, you're not, you know, your days or your hours are limited, and they were going to attack very soon. So what does King Hezekiah do here? He turned to God. And he recognized him as being the refuge and strength. And he states here that he is in very present of trouble, and he was, he was in great trouble. The Assyrians were at their doorsteps just waiting for the word to go in and to destroy. You know, the news that, were, that was out there was not good news. It was being reported of all bad news. There was no way out. But the good news was within. God was their refuge. He was their strength. And he helps in times of troubles and in need. Do you think there's a lesson we can learn just from that alone? You know, who is our refuge and strength when things seem bleak? God is. That's something we know. He listened to them and he listens to us. And we see this in Psalms 46. Let's go to verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble in its swelling. There is a river whose streams makes glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. You know, during troubled times, he recognized that God is in their midst. And he knows what God can do. He knows that God is more powerful than the Assyrian army that is out there. And he recognizes it again here in verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. Our God of Jacob is our fortress. God was with them. God, he knew that God could protect them. Yes, the Assyrian armies was out there and they had them surrounded, but he also knew that God was with them. God was in their midst. You know, during troubled times, don't we always feel alone? We wonder if anybody cares or if anybody is listening. You know, perhaps something is in your life that may seem overwhelming and is weighing on your mind. But we know that can happen in so many different ways. You may feel like that there's an army at your doorstep surrounding you, against you, but know this, God is with you. God is, is in your midst. He is with you every step of the way. God didn't create us to abandon us. That isn't how it works. He has the ability to save us if we let him. He is, he is uh, uh, he's big enough to create the world just by his command and loving enough to care about us in our moments when we're in our dark place. He cares so much for us. The author understands this in verse uh, 8. And I love this part of the, uh, this chapter. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease. To the end of the earth, he breaks the bows and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. That is our God. He breaks the bows. He shatters the spears. He burns the chariots of the fires of our enemy. And he knows what to do and he knows when to do it. The Lord knows best. It may not feel like it at times when we're in our dark place. But he, he is amazing. 
He knows what to do. He is powerful enough to do anything in, in our life. We just have to let him do it. We have to put our trust in him. Verse 10, my favorite part. This is probably my favorite part in all the book of Psalms. At the same time, it's probably the hardest thing to fulfill. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted, exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our fortress. You know, it's hard being still, isn't it? It's hard being still during a difficult time. It's easier to jump up and down and blame everyone for our failures and take the advice here, or take, if we need to take the advice here, if we be still, we will know that he is God. We will know that he is in control. It doesn't say to be still and believe, or be still and hope, or be still and think, but be still and know that he is God. God can rescue you and redeem you when needed. You know, can you imagine what was going through the minds of the people of Jerusalem at this time? You know, the Assyrians were out there and they had them surrounded. And you're telling us to be still? You know, we need a plan. We need to have a fighting chance against them. But one thing we know, as we already saw by the request of King Hezekiah, they, be, they were still. They didn't provoke them and, and to, you know, creating the situation worse. They did not answer him. How many times have we prayed to God, we tried to tell God what to do, how to do it, and if He just listened to us, things are going to work out better. He knows best. He knows what to do and when to do it. You know, we have to remember that God knew what they needed to do, that is to be still. And the Scripture didn't say to be anxious or to know or to be worried and know or to be freaked out and know to be still and know that he is God. He is so powerful, he oversees everything in this world at the same time he knows what's on our heart. You know, one thing we talked to on Wednesday not, not too long ago, how, how complex the universe is. He knows all the stars' name. And I looked up, there's around 8 billion people in this world Yet he knows everything that's going on in the, in the universe, the complexity of it. At the same time, he knows everything that's going on in everybody's heart. That's God. That's who he is. You know, anxiety isn't anything new. It can overwhelm you and cause you to make bad decisions. But I want you to listen to this. I think this is very important. The moment we become still is the, the time, is the moment... We come to the realization there's only so much we can do in our life. And that's when we need to step back and let God handle the situation. Let God be in control of our life and learn to let go. It's hard to let go. You know, we can fall. We can let depression set in. We can let disappointment set in. These things are going to happen. No one is immune to it. But instead... Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know he is God. In the moment that takes place, God is going to provide you a peace in your heart and in your mind when you let it go and let God take control. And be still. When that happens, be still and he will show you that he is God. Silence can be a wonderful thing. And if all we're hearing is noise, it can cause such a distraction and prevent us from knowing that he is God. I'd like to look at some examples here in the New Testament. You don't have to turn here. In Luke chapter 6, we see here that Jesus, in verse 12, went to the mountains and prayed. All night continued in prayer to God. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, the final hours for Jesus is he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass before me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. So we see that Jesus went away and he prayed to be, and he was all alone. We even see Jesus needed to talk to God. 
Now, how many men would you think it would take to defeat an army of 185,000 of the best soldiers at this time? Let's fast forward to 2 Kings chapter 19, and let's see how God fulfilled his promise to these people. 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 35. And that night the angel of the Lord went down and struck down the 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, they were all the dead bodies. So we see here that God sent out an angel and he destroyed the army except for the king. And then instead of verse 36, it tells us how the king of Assyria departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. And there he began to worship his own gods, and there his own sons struck him down by the sword, just as God predicted it would happen. Here's the best fighters of the world, destroyed because he thought he could defeat God. He lost it all. He lost his trained soldiers who were very skilled, and they were no match to God. You know, the scripture doesn't give us any kind of indication how the people of Jerusalem reacted, but I would imagine they probably had a celebration that night. You know, they I'm sure they what they would do know is they knew that he was God. You know, perhaps you need God to be that one in your life to heal you and bring you back to where you need to be. In what way do you need God to show up in your life? Do you need, is there something going on in your life in which you need God? Be still and know that he is God. Give it all to him. Let him take you by the hand and encourage you and be the person that he wants you to be, not the person you want to be, but the person he wants you to be. And let the church help you too. You know, the, cur the church is a great place where God's people come together and we care so much for each other here. You know, we have a lot of people here who's been challenged in one way or another. They can share that wisdom with you to help you and encourage you. As always, we want to give you time for opportunity to come forward. Please come stand if you need help.